Hello and welcome to this session in which we will discuss the sale of the taxpayer principal residence, which is your own home, section 121. In my opinion, this is one of the most generous tax law that the U.S. government, the Congress, grant to taxpayers. I did use this section 121 in the past, in year 2006. Soon I might be selling my home. I might use it again in either 2022 if not 2022, most likely in 2023, I will be selling my home and I will take advantage of this exclusion. This is a non-taxable, non-taxable gain. So this topic, I just want to make sure we are aware of it. It falls under the deferred or non-taxable gain. Specifically, this gain will be non-taxable. It will not be deferred. The Congress is that generous when it comes to taxpayer when they sell their home which is their personal residence. Before we proceed any further, I have a public announcement about my company, FarhatLectures.com. Farhat Accounting Lectures is a supplemental educational tool that's gonna help you with your CPA exam preparation as well as your accounting courses. My CPA material is aligned with your CPA review course such as Becker, Roger, Wiley, Gleam, Miles. My accounting courses are aligned with your accounting courses broken down by chapter and topics. My resources consist of lectures, multiple choice questions, true false questions, as well as exercises. Go ahead, start your free trial today. No obligation, no credit card required. So let's go ahead and get started. A taxpayer who sells his principal residence at a gain is eligible to exclude from his or her income part or total gain, depending on the amount of the gain, provided some conditions are met. And we're gonna see what the conditions are and what the amounts are. To be eligible, the taxpayer should have owned and used the property at his or her principal residence at least two of the last five years prior to the date on which the sale transaction was completed and closed. Simply put, you have to live in that principal residence, use it as a principal residence, two of the five years, of the past five years. For married filing jointly taxpayer, either spouse meet the ownership. Remember, you have to own it and live in it. If you are married to qualify, only one individual has to meet the ownership test. However, both spouses have to meet the use test, the use test requirement. Let's assume I bought a home in 20X1, 20X1, and let's assume uh, January 1st, tw January 1st, 20X1, year one. And I lived in it, 20X1, 20X2, 20X3, 20X4. Now in 20X4, at the end of 20X4, December 31st, I get married. My wife and I started to live in this property, 20X5. We live in the property only for one year together, 20X5. Then we decided to sell. Now, as far as the ownership, I own the property two of the past five years. So only one individual will have to own the property. So even if I, don't, if, if I did not add my spouse to the ownership, that's fine. It's okay. I, I meet the ownership property. However, we both did not live in the property for two years. We only lived for one year, then we sold it. Therefore, I will meet only the exclusion for a single, and I would only be able to deduct from the gain exclude from the gain 250,000. Why? Because I lived with my wife only one year. So we did not meet the use requirement. If we met the use requirement, if we waited until 20X6 and we lived there 20X6, then we sold the property. Then we would be considered married filing, filing jointly, married filing jointly for this exclusion and be able to exclude half a million. Just, just be aware of this small trick. Also, if you are widow or widower, just want to make sure you understand also married, file, married filing single and head of a household, they get the 250000 However, taxpayer filing as a widow or widower is eligible for the full exclusion as married filing jointly. If the residence, the person that lived there, owned and occupied it with the decedent spouse when the, de with the decedent spouse was sold within two years after the date of death. So two years after the date of death, as long as you guys live together at the date of death, you would qualify. It's important to note that the period of ownership does not need to be continuous. In other words, non-qualified uses of the property are permissible, but they reduce the amount of the exclusion available. And we would look at the non-qualified uses later on. How does it work? So you don't have to be there for the, you know, continuously, but you may get something called non-qualified uses. 
In contrast to involuntary conversion, the taxpayer are not required to replace the property to benefit from the gain X exclusion. So let's assume I sold my home. I don't have to buy another home to get the gain. I can sell my home, take the gain, the 250 or half a million gain, whatever that amount is, was excluded, deposit that money in my personal account and rent. I don't have to buy a home to qualify. So keep that in mind. It's not like involuntary conversion where I have to replace the property. In addition, taxpayer may benefit from such ex exclusion several times during their lives. I already told you, I already did this in 2006, and I may go through this in 2023, provided that I meet the ownership and the use requirement. So this ex exclusion is renewable. Now, there are some hardship provisions. What are the hardship provisions? Well, let's assume you had to sell your home for reasons that are beyond your circumstances. Then you do have a hardship provision. A taxpayer who sells his principal residence before completing the two-year ownership and use may be eligible for a partial exclusion if the sale was due to change of employment, his or her employment, and his or her employment, and the new job has to be greater than 50 miles from your residence. A health condition, you have a health condition, or significant unforeseen event or events such as involuntary conversion, natural disaster, for example, the Eon hurricane right now, I'm pretty sure a lot of people will have to sell their residency. Uh, a divorce might qualify, multiple births resulted from the same pregnancy could qualify as well. That's a good problem to have, right? This is referred to as the hardship provisions. Under this provision, the way it works, the amount of the reduced exclusion is computed by taking the exclusion available, and that exclusion available could be 250 or 500,000, depending on whether you are considered single or married filing jointly, times a ratio of the number of months over the over which the taxpayer has owned and occupied the property over 24. Why over 24? Because remember, you have to live there for two years. And don't worry, we would look at an example. And this is what the ratio would look like. Total exclusion available times by the number of ownership and use divided by 24 because you live there less than two years. Let's take a look at an example. March 1st, Robert, a single taxpayer and, and March 1st, X3 acquired property for 580 after occupying the property for one year he was diagnosed with a severe heart disease he decided to sell his property and purchase a new one near a hospital with a heart disease specialization now robert sold his residency march 2nd a year later for 915 the property went up substantially including brokerage commission of 12,000. it means he had to pay the brokerage commission now let's compute the amount of realized gain and the exclusion as well. Determine the amount of gain, if any, Robert may exclude. Well, let's first compute the gain. A single taxpayer is eligible for 250. However, since he lived there for one year and he moved out, but he qualified under the hardship provision, he's qualified for partial exclusion. Well, let's take a look. What's the partial exclusion? 250 multiplied by 12 over 24. He lived there. 12 months out of the 24 to, to qualify for the fall, which is 125. Now let's determine the amount of gain to be recognized. Amount realized is 915 minus the selling expense. Remember, if there's any selling expense, you deduct it equal to 903. So commission is considered a selling expense. Then less adjusted basis. Remember, the adjusted basis could be could be different than 580 in case you have a capital improvement. We'll have a realized gain of 325. So this is the realized. Of this amount, we can exclude 125, and the remainder, 198, is taxable. This amount is taxable. So the total gain, the total gain is 323. The amount that's taxable is 198. That's pretty generous. Now, if Robert lived there for another year, then he'll, he will be able to get the full exclusion. Let's discuss the non-qualified use. This law started after January 1st, 2010. A non-qualified use occur when the taxpayer uses his home for purposes other than principal residence, for example, rent, before meeting the two-year requirement. So this rental period, let's assume you rented your property, is not considered a period of disqualified as long as it occurs after the last day the home was used as the taxpayer principal residence. Simply put, if you met the two out of the, out of the five-year period, then you rent it, that's different. But simply put, 
if you rented in between so this remember this two year if you rented it in between so let's assume you live there for one year rent then live there another year or two more years so notice what happened here before you met the two-year period you rented the property so this is it will be considered disqualified but after assuming you live there one two three years then you rent then you sold then you rent for one year then you sold it's fine you that's not disqualified because you could rent your property after you have met the two out of the five year period for non-qualified use the gain eligible for section 121 exclusion is reduced let's take a look at the formula the amount of the gain that's not eligible for the X exclusion. How is it computed? Well, we look at the gain realized, we compute this, then we multiply this by the ratio of the number of years of non-qualified use over the total number of years of which the taxpayer owned the property. Now, it, it doesn't have to be years, it could be in terms of months, but the point is it's the period prorated. So the gain ineligible for the X exclusion, well, gain realized we compute this and we multiply it by this ratio which is again number of month of non-qualified use with number of month number of years which is the time of non-qualified use divided by the total month of ownership and this is the ratio so the realized gain times this ratio and the best way to illustrate this is to look at an example january 1st david a single taxpayer acquired the property for 650 he lived in that property for one year, then moved in with his friends to his friend's place and rented his property to a tenant for two two year period. January first, Robert moved back to his own property where he lived for the whole year. Now, so what happened is this he lived there twenty X four. Okay, then he moved out twenty X five rent, he rented the property, twenty X six rented, twenty X seven lived there so lived there for one two years so but notice he did not before he qualified for the two out of the five year he rented the property he rented the property here so what's going to happen is this and he sold it january at 20 x8 for 225 for a gain of 225 so this is we're giving we're giving the gain here what's going to happen is this determine the amount of gain if any that's not eligible yes yeah, some of it will not be eligible that's correct Robert used the property for a total period of four years. Out of the four years, there are two years that are considered non-qualified use. Therefore, the gain realized by David is not eligible under the section 121, and it should be reduced. What should we do? The gain is 225, which, which we are given, multiplied by two out of four. Remember, we just this is because we have the years. If it's month, we have to prorate by month. So the gain that's not eligible is 112,500 determine the amount of the gain that's re that's that's recognized well obviously the gain realized by robert from the sale is 225 of that 225 he's eligible for 250 in total but he, we're going to be reducing it by 225 will be reduced by 112 500 therefore what's left half of the gain is recognized half of the gain is tax-free so he qualified for a total of 250, but he did not have a gain of 250. He have of 225. And what's going to happen? We're going to split it in half. Part of it is taxable. Taxable will be 50% of it. And non-taxable, which is subject to section 121, 50% of it. That's still not bad. That's still not bad. But what should have David did is lived in the house for two years first meet the qualification then rent it and sell it within the qualified period that would have been a better option and this is where the tax advice will be very beneficial that's why you should always talk to a cpa before we make making such moves what should you do now or ea uh, go to farhat lectures whether you are a cpa or an ea candidate or a college student and look at additional resources work mcqs true false that's going to help you understand this topic this is an important topic. It's tested on the CPA exam because, as you might know, many people sell their homes. So it's a common occurrence in the real world. Therefore, the CPA will test it. The EA will test it. And as a college student, you need to be familiar with this. Good luck. Stay safe. The CPA exam is worth it.